Welcome to Authors and Artists Festival Rewilding. I'm Lise McLaughlin and your host from Nature Culture. Our sponsors include the New England Grassroots Environment Fund, Mary King, Kathy Clemens, and Rescue Poetics. The festival is brought to you with help from the Nature Imaginarium, Human Error Publishing, and SCORE.org. Thank you to all our sponsors and colleagues and our presenters especially and to you for being here. This session is Writing the Land Poets, session three. Our first reader is Mary Gilliland. Great, thank you, Lise. It's really wonderful to be listening to all this great poetry all day. I feel I'm in my with my caress and uh, using our ears and our eyes and our hands to uh, honor the rest of nature. I'm going to read from my published books and my forthcoming book. Um, and I'm going to begin and end with poems about a land that's far away, uh, a place nearby, an area that was called when I was in school, it was called the Holy Land. Uh, one of my favorite teaching experiences was at Wild Cornell Medicine, uh, Qatar, in Doha. And so this poem describes it as Doha was about. 15 years ago, before it suddenly went from Bedouin villages to 21st century skyscrapers, it was in that process. Flamingos feed far in the shallows. Embassy Row starts with Morocco in salmon cement, then Pakistan, Egypt, spaces in sand for what will be India, turns the corner in beauty glazed azure, scrolled lemon, and cobalt spiral motifs of Iran. At the sea line, there's rubble, tan and black nurslings, sometimes a white one feed at the camel souk. The falcon souk, small and deserted, is locked since avian flu turned regalia to harness. The city's one suburb grows south past the bay, along the big water. Skirted guest workers dock the day's catch, unload the gulf shrimp that fills one of the sandwiches served for high tea in the first floor cafe of a place built to seem a square Aztec temple, the Sheraton Doha. Mangroves that lined shores have donated salt flats to fill for construction. Fewer pink stilted birds winter over. Uh, here's uh, uh, from the Devil's Fools. Uh, this is called Lit with Radiance. And the poem's recurring words, uh, joy, sorrow, and glory are taken from uh, the Roman Catholic rosaries named for the mysteries that you recite when you're, when you're saying a rosary. Lit with radiance. Joy oscillates to sorrow as a dolphin breathes one element to move in another. As a butterfly eats the plant's green solids when it crawls, the nectar when it's winged. Sorrow fathoms glory as a tree's roots curl irregular in shape and thickness unsteadying the outline of its trunk. Glory rouses joy, the way a mystery comes close to a shadow, or a shoulder leads the knee from ground to space, where curvature saddles the known universe. Joy announces sorrow in the wish to live in many countries, turn all corners, marvel at the streets, and wash them. Sorrow ambers glory inside shabby rental houses, motes of sunlight, pollen, shoes well broken in. This particular pink stilted bird uh, loves plants, uh, especially herbs, our allies in health and wholeness. And these next poems are from uh, The Devil's Fools. 
motherwort, wort being the Anglo-Saxon word that simply means plant. As forest green leaves reverse in wind, dusty silver undersides veins bulge. Embryonic rings of spurred seeds halt hands slide at intervals along the tall four-sided stalk. Leonorus cardiaca has a Robin Sherwood shine, a slightly darker, slightly danker nature than its fellow weeds. Minute orchids top the taloned seed crowns, frill pink visors. Whence the fomentative power, plucked, bruised, steeped, to break fever, lift childbirth cramp. And the insects, let us honor them. It's a theme for today. The language of bees on the rooftop garden, over the gall flies home, the bald faced hornet sips nectar, the shag rug of florets covers her feet, mated already, surviving, she'll overwinter in litter, then pulp wood in her mouth for a pendant gray paper nest. The larvae will close their own cells. The year carries its freight, it's September. At the gambrel of goldenrod plumes, she rocks in the sun, pine fragrance stirring. The slick yellow and black stripes of her abdomen pulse bent to her mouth music. And I want to read a poem, especially for the borders of wilding gardens, which is the kind of gardening I do, uh, in process acre of a sanctuary at the wood's edge. Nemesis. The burdock, no one dug for spring tempura, or a boast of victory over taproot, leaves out vast and ribbed. Its stalk crests the human head, blossoming magenta. During August, the young burr scratches shoulders, teases clothes. Mercy will vanish as it dries, and the winds whisper a pox on the horse's tail, the neat edge of a lawn. Persistent as shark or cockroach, burdock remembers ferns high as trees, brontosaurus necks lengthening until their pea heads could chew enormous fiddleheads. Sharp cold or claws sudden in the belly, bringing them to earth. In daylight and darkness, throughout nature's mammal dreams, Burdock heard first the apes who walked, sure they would wear the crown. And we're just getting light frost in the Finger Lakes of New York State, where I where I live. Winter in the garden, and this is about a real garden and a real toad. When I spot, when I squat to the spade base, the handle does the lifting. So I see the yellowed body in cascades of loosened earth with the blind human movement toward the future. My pointer finger tucks the damp sack of her belly. A webbed foot rests on clods of grubs and buried eggs whose hatch will wake her. With the half mew of a cat moved from an easy chair, the toad rebukes me in her dreaming. And then this last poem I'm going to read um, is from Ember Days, which Codhill Press is bringing out next March. And I also want to uh, remind other poets here, Codhill currently has their annual contest open for the Pauline Uchmanowicz Award. And um, so if you have a manuscript ready, I urge you, uh, it's a good press. Um, so my book, Ember Days, begins with ritual and ends with prayer. And I'm going to read the prayer um, addressed 
from the relative peace of North America to the Middle East. Again, I, I started writing this poem when I taught in Doha, where across the Gulf, the uh, my um, our commander in chief had bombed Baghdad back to the Stone Age. The title's an actual modified quote from an article in Policy Journal, World Policy Journal. A uses more ordinance in a single campaign than B used in epochs of imperial rule. May you not be subjected to civilizing missions. May you want to continue more than you want to stop. May God move your muscles as you lie there. May you be passed over by the local police. May God spare you the mornings of steady heat. May your computers learn to make the dead talk. May no one stop your ears to the bee hum. May none indulge in witty banner before the eerie video clip. May God roll in the fog in the first cool hour. May your weeping with remembrance be in slippers. May you be forcible within your heart. May your fertile regions not be barbarized, nor your large populations. May you dine in restaurants and work in offices. May the light enlarge thy days. May God occupy thy country. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Mary Gilliland. Uh, very powerful poems. Okay. Our next reader is David Cruz. Hi, David. Welcome. Thank you, Lise, uh, and company for this uh, great event. Um, to the other poets, thank you for allowing me to share in this space. Uh, it's a great opportunity, uh, and it's much appreciated. I'm going to read a few poems from some uh, new work. It's uh, poems that are part of a longer cycle of uh, on the Hoosick River. This work was created for the Hoosick River Watershed Association, a great nonprofit in Williamstown, Massachusetts. They um, describe themselves as a citizens group that looks after the river. And I've uh, been learning a lot about the watershed and the river itself, uh, kind of a, an amazing journey. The Hoosick River actually begins in source waters at the Cheshire Reservoir, which is on an east shoulder of Mount Greylock. Mount Greylock uh, being the highest point in the state of Massachusetts. The river leaves Cheshire Reservoir, travels uh, northbound alongside the Appalachian Trail, flows into the town of North Adams, picks up the South Branch, hits the Hoosack Mountain Range, turns left, travels west into Williamstown, uh, picks up Green River, hits the northern Taconic mountain range, then begins to snake northwest through southern Vermont into New York, uh, flows through Hoosick Falls, picks up the Wallumsack River, and then bends west and travels uh, toward the Hudson, which is a journey of about 70 miles. Um, one of the few rivers, too, interestingly enough, that travels uh, northwest, where most rivers in the northeast here uh, flow southeast to the sea. Um, this, this land here, also, it's important to note, is uh, ancestral lands of Western Abenaki and Muhi Konyok peoples. And a lot of my research uh, for some of these poems have, have brought me into these spaces. And, and one of the poems I'll read for you today um, dives into some of that history. So uh, here are three sections from Hoosick River. Also, I wanted to mention all these poems are written from visiting public preserved lands within the watershed. Corridor. I hear the words over and over again. Blessed is the human whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. I will bear myself fully to each new moment without regret or hesitation. This is a lie. The river keeps time as it moves into space. The water 
a mirror, the violence always downstream. How does the river talk? What to say? Will it always be the deep song of pain? Weeping, my friend says. Is it only love that makes a place? How does one carry these depths? Small calls of birds on the ridge. The river carries all of it. Will I find myself able to love the way a river moves between flute and tense abandon? To be water flowing over rock through earth, to be water and not dream of death, species lost, thrushes, ash trees, to not live a life in constant danger, wildfire, flood, riot, gun. South Corridor. The Appalachian Trail logs over 1,500 miles from Springer Mountain northbound till it finally crosses the south branch of the Hoosick as the river leaves source waters of the Cheshire Reservoir in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. The footpath meanders around field and pasture before climbing the south shoulder of Greylock, passing between Cole Mountain Jones Nose over Saddleball Mountain to a summit 3,491 feet above the level of the sea, the highest point in the state. Grela Wawanolowa was a Western Abenaki warrior and chieftain from the Waranoki Band of Westfield River who fought for the Masisiko Wabanaki Coalition and who led resistance against English armies in the early 18th century, conducting raids on colonial settlements from coastal Maine along the Kennebec throughout the Connecticut River Valley to Lake Champlain. As quickly he would descend upon guard and fort, he and his war parties, mobile and invisible, would again disappear into the vast wilderness of Green Mountain Forest. In 1722, Governor Samuel Shute declared war on the main Abenaki, proclaiming the Confederates were robbers, traitors, and enemies to His Majesty King George. And for the next five years, ignoring talks and calls for peace from governors in Albany and New Hampshire, Greylock continued a campaign to liberate Beneke peoples. He was never captured or killed, and his people were not liberated, but fled like so many to Canada. And Greylock, Wawanolowa, during the years of peace that followed, fathered a daughter and a son, and with his family carried out his days to an old age in the mountains and rivers of his ancestral lands. And what happened to him, no one really knows. And to speak of him is to not let his spirit rest. And to speak of him in an act of praise. Praise the heart and what it carries, incessant longing. Praise the river. Take me to the river that falls as water does in time and rhythm and what of remembering. East Corridor. Deep in the Glastonbury wilderness, feeding streams to the Wallum sack network like veins or synapse fire from the source, the roots of great red oak or what I imagine them to be. My trust only goes to certain depths, the map tells me. An unidentified bird song throws tight little spirals into the far reaches of hemlock forest, more a product of an ecosystem than a poem, so close to the edge of truth and beauty. And to move north alongside the AT Ridge in late May is to be chasing warblers, at the tail end of mud season, moss season. I step from rock to rock, a whisper in the woods, so light 
streams flute away to their circadian rhythms. On the trail to Bold Mountain, a sitting rock at the meeting point of deciduous conifer forests, a meditation spot on eco tones and life. There, miles ago, when I truly felt alone, before this chorus of rattle, scree, and jive, sweet, sweet zoo, Blackburnian, pine, myrtle, the flies thick and heavy in feel. They are dying, he once said to me. You know, each year there are fewer and fewer. They don't come back. Here at the highest point around is to visit too with ravens. Their calls will alert bedrock, the West Ridge Trail to the fire tower on Glastonbury, chart the high elevations that scape the eastern boundary of the watershed. And even in late spring, it already feels dry. And these birds, these trees, what will happen to the rivers we know? Thank you. Thank you, David. Very evocative poem. Um, our next reader is Holly Russell. The first poem I'd like to read was the first poem I ever had published uh, during the pandemic in uh, a book from published in India called Hibiscus, Poems That Heal and Empower. And I wrote a poem about a tikka called Hemisphere. Water holds delight suspended, clear down to brush strokes, clearly etched in rose, blue, leaf green. Wainscoting hugs the sides of the ivory china circle. Is this really what we're talking about? A cup whose flowers shine below the crystal surface, a woodland carpet washed by a river overflowing its banks. Now um, I'm going to read from Writing the Land Currents that I had the honor to be asked to participate in. It came out last year and I wrote about three properties in my town of Darien, Connecticut. Uh, the first one is called Olson Woods Spring. Silver bend of the Narotan River, capturing sky and the dance of the trees, summon schools of alewife and blue-black herring who flash in its depths to breed. The second property is in a place called Dunlap Woods, uh, right next to the highway, right next to 95. And the name of the poem is Quiet World. Leaves shelter the floor of hills and wetlands, caretakers of life on an infinite scale. Brush piles house creatures, a pool bubbles with tadpoles. Swans and mallards skim the lake, floating through the whistle of a train rushing by. We forget to hurry in this place. We take our time. It's ours in abundance. At least that's what it seems. Only the fairies might question the lack of urgency, whisking behind doors at the base of the trees so that we see only shadows of branch and foliage falling over the trail when we pass. And the third poem um, is in a meadow near the house where I'm, and I go and walk my dog here a lot. It's a very beautiful, unspoiled place at sort of a crossroads of several roads. In the heart of Mather Meadows. Four corners of history resolve in this tapestry where grapevines run wild and maple trees glow crimson in the fall. A crumbling wall holds in its stones, secrets we'll never know. Bees sift pollen across from the homestead, humming past lives and deeds to the pulse of the earth, spinning on its axis, 
connecting with the stars, constant and eternal. And one generation slips into the next, the ground here to catch us when we fall. I'm now going to read a poem. It's called Dandelion. And I wrote it uh, when my oldest son left to go off to college. Little clocks tumble by the bird feeder, tolling the hours since you have gone. When the fields open, swallowing the earth mother's daughter, blood of pomegranate on her lips, she bowed her back and returned to the soil, plowing her grief into what she knew best, blessing the dirt in the seams of her hands. And what of you, gossamer spores tossed dancing on the wind, my first flower gone to seed, and you can't wait, and I'm still here learning acceptance. And this poem came out last year in the Ogham Stone Literary Magazine in Limerick, Ireland. And it was very exciting for me because I had always wanted to be Irish because the poets are so great. And I did, I was convinced that I might be. So I did the 23 and Me, and I am Irish. So it was very exciting and I'm very, I was thrilled to have this poem in an Irish literary magazine. This was one of the first poems I've ever wrote in about 2019. Obsidian. Granite spindle cloaked in lichen, touched by wind and frost and rain. It rises higher than the stones that form a wall to bound the graves. I don't want to see your face. I know you're here. Hush, says the meadow. Please let us forget our debts today. These markers on the hillside forgive no echo of the past. They won't tell me who you were or what you mean to me. All I can do is not black eyed Susan's, Queen Anne's lace and place them on your name. Insects buzz on stalks and earth. I hear the clap of spangled fritillaries. I ponder us and how we ended on that end of summer day. You among your cards and pictures, your eyes no longer fit pinwheels, your features bone. Truth lies in our biology, my mistrust, the volcanic glass that shaped your heart. Am I supposed to say I wish things were different when you were all I knew? I would prefer to walk this hillside where grasshoppers sing and amber butterflies float over regret and buried pain. This poem um, I wrote last uh, New Year's, my son, I have two sons, and one of them was coming back from a deployment up at Fort Drum, New York, when there was the, when the blizzard hit. And uh, my other son went up to get him and got stuck in a snowbank. And he was okay, but he spent the night in the blizzard. Uh, but a lot of people died in the blizzard upstate New York. So this poem is for them. It came out in the Ear Literary Magazine this May, and it's called Crystal. One cold white flake spins out of the muffled heights, one flake following another, crystals becoming dusts, becoming drifts, becoming 80 inches of snow in Buffalo, New York, where at least 39 people have been whited out, gone. Hearts stopped in the midst of clearing and shoveling. A father froze before holding his soon-to-be-born child. A grandmother vanished. A young woman perished, texting family in her car. No presents went unwrapped under my tree this Christmas. No crystal tore loose from the matrix of my soul. 
My son texted from his car on Friday, northeast of the center of the blizzard, wedged in a drift, snowy night, closing in. I'm toasty, he said, having wrapped himself in blankets, including the towel I spread for the dog. He had gas in the tank. A patrol tar car checked in on him. A tow truck hoped to come. And yes, the next day he made it home. The news cycles on. The weather listens to its prophets. We focus on the present and put aside the might have been. As a child in the 1970s, I remember sitting on the couch, flipping through pictures in National Geographic magazines. I remember when I stopped to give one page my full attention, a tiny figure in a knitted hat, her socks bound with strips of hide. Was it the Andes where she lay frozen with the whole of snow around her? The Himalayas? I don't remember, nor when I searched the web, do I find a trace of her today? She lives with me still though, the way she lived centuries earlier, before she died alone, trapped in the snow. Thank you, Holly Russell. Um, our next reader is Robin Goldberg. Hello, everyone. Thank you first to everyone who has poured time and care into the festival and the Writing the Land project. and. And thank you to the poets who have infused their words with such love for the land. I am reading today from the rivers and the forests of southern Michigan on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe and Wyandotte people. And the first three poems that um, I will read have been shaped by this ecosystem. And the last two are odes to the Pacific Northwest, specifically the Salish Sea and the Ho River watershed. Firefly side. The lacy language of crickets attunes the dunes to the dreams of surprise sisters. Mossy yawns stretch across harmonium keys, sinking scrapbook pages with cellular respiration. Mist whistles rotate around mandalas, arranging raindrops into kaleidoscope questions for fireside contemplation. Polyglide. Blink once, twice, three times, leading once with each eye, leading with the one in the middle, when clarity is essential. Synchronize all sunlight cells, allowing inner pine cones to rise. Support each stem with honeycomb carols while caressing vocal cords with hummingbird words while harmonizing with communal gurgles. Slide between schools of fish and jasmine ensembles to find mycelial spider webs flowing freely like sunrise gliding across the water. Arboreal embrace. Elder bark and berries love our lungs. Let's embrace them by adding clean air to Medicare, replacing SATs with smelling trees, questioning green yards before our green cards. Elderbark and berries cool capitals and corporations. Let's embrace them by savoring sap instead of bottled maple syrup by adoring sandalwood beaches instead of plastic flip-flops, by wrapping furs with soil instead of reconstituted relatives. Elder bark and berries design sapling dwellings. Let's embrace them by reforesting phloem, respecting arborist sentience, 
restoring botanical belonging. Trilingual time. As a new moon rises within the feathers of a fern, from the eye of a spiral watching over timeless mosses, we root our toes among the flocks and hemlocks who taste a liquid language. As our breaths rise and fall like the Salish waves of your youth, our ears hear the swimming pools and skating rinks of one story, one creation tale that asks us to sip the past in the present for the future. As ancestral owls shape tide pools into sea star sculptures, our hydrodula hands cradle raindrops like trilingual snowflakes, knitting intricate fronds into reflecting ponds filled with infinite crystalline configurations of transformation. Compass of spirals. Arriving feels like reaching, rising, and remembering timeless tide pools filled with dune land doors for footprint films, nonlinear zines, and intergenerational intuition. Orienting feels like gathering cedar bark, growing glacial jewelry, and seeding tapestries of integrals and infinities. Breathing feels like birthing and embodying braided names for research, rest, and drain. Belonging feels like seeing freckled ferns reflected in the starry ceiling, a watercolor sky illuminated by blue heron ballets flowing from a fractal core of collective care. This piece is called Painting Root Prints. A forest of rivers reaches beneath the lake, shaping dune land lyrics along the way. An aquarium stretches skyward like the Sphinx, rising from a sandbox, searching for an iridescent nest. When a worm surfaces at the untraceable source of a stream, Soil signs lead from eviction to adoption, from luxurious laundromats to libraries confined to time capsules filled with frozen ozone. Hand painted pineapples dissolve droughts and doubts of familial mycophobia while reframing palms as waterproof portals into lush light years. In between chapters, mycelia reveal that maple trees are not traitors, but rather mothers and mentors who miss sharing notes of nectar with emerging musicians. Behind sunflower faces, betrayal becomes beauty and uncertainty becomes spaciousness, filled with fresh air for mermaids and birds born from seeds of synergy. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Robin Goldberg. Ah, beautiful language there. Let's move on to Rescue Poetics, who I know is always ready. Thank you, thank you. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here among this esteemed group of poets. I truly appreciate this opportunity. This first piece is uh, written in honor of um, 
uh, the caldera in Greece, uh, specifically the Black Rock. From separate strengths they joined, one power of three emerged, trinity of creativity, passion, inspiration. Along paths of black rock, rich earth stretch above to touch heavens, hands, shores of Santarini, glorious rise. Through her violent rebirth, brought from ancient living, breathing earth, her richness and warmth surrounded by heated stones of tradition. Her face may have changed. Santorini will always remain a tribute to the fierce passion of her people gone now and yet to come. In this they unite, Trinity, a reflection of strength, rhythm and divinity, monolith of proud beliefs, shadowed by lush darkness. Her sacrifices become those other people warm of her waters. A reminder of how deep she flows through, shaping future from past lives. Her warmth changes only with the current. Her strength as immortal as black sands, she gives only the best. With reverence, the sun bows. Her grace befitting her resilience, an honor of strength to include the trinity from her earth. An ever flowing sound across her surface, reaching into the spirit of her love, her children born into this majesty. The three, trinity, inspiration, rhythm, light. They come together to breathe from dark, dark surface, rent from fire, facing each curve, rise and dip. Her tales of rich design whispered on the current from peaks down to shores tailored for life, rent to embrace, bent to embrace, ever changing winds. Her soul older than words as we know, give life to her children through wealth of family. Each pebble of black carries with it the memories of laughter and love along her cliffs and walls. Within her lies the virtue of Trinity. Lifted into the face of the world, her sons carry on her legacy from the black rocks of Santorini to an open blessing of Trinity, her people born of fire. Thank you. And this next one speaks about the sunsets. I have witnessed sunsets over mountains at the lip of gaping canyons on rooftops face flushed, watch as she dips behind skyscrapers, a bird's eye view through glass. Each one brings something different, each carries its own memories and fire, every single one births a new night. There is a particular sunset, standing on a wooded, riveted walkway as turquoise waters turn purple on a day when clouds fold over in harmony with the waves, this sunset stands out. Her colors boggle the mind with a presence that ignites the spirit, grace that eases the body to halt. It's as if she reaches her arms wide, embraces all, giving thanks for the day, yielding to the night. She lowers her head below the horizon, a farewell kiss of heat on cool lapping waters. She surrenders with poise, preparing for her rise, carrying laughter, memories of the day. Some watch as she turns to slumber, giving thanks in return as the sun dips behind their touch. I guess that's how the sun should set in the center of the universe. 
Thank you. And this next piece, since we're on the topic of insects, I figured this would be most appropriate. Picking up bits of pollen, adhere to self. It's a lonely effort to make things whole. The hum of bumblebees breathing along the way, deep in hum, out, buzzing like wings of a hummingbird. Specks on the horizon. The world is vastly different through the eyes of happiness, growth, and hiding joy. Delicate surrenders of self, fine like cat's whiskers, all with a single purpose, the bee, the hummingbird, the dragonfly, harbingers of self, joy, and discovery. It's a lonely effort to make things whole. Jumping from one to another to another, buzz in, tap out, breathe deep, time to move on. Thank you. This next one is called Trial by Fire or Trapped in the Cold, a daily battle for paradise. Actions are manifestations born of parables and blueprints, work flow from imagined to reality. Each action, each movement rooted in beliefs, self-actualized prophecies, self-contained manifestations. Heaven is within pushing to get out, evoking certainty of success, however it may reveal itself. Hell holds space in self-doubt. Fear, locked, wrought iron gate, holding us prisoner. Squelching confidence are the poetics of opposition. Touching heaven, Volcano fires jumped, obsidian used as stepping stones. Black ash burns and flows, each step sharp edges. Hell, cold, unrelenting, and safe, making us small, unseen, and unrealized. Devil we know is ourselves, tempered by rejection. Thank you. And this one is what I once was, I am no more. Humans are based on ideas recreating ourselves from remnants, pieces that once held value, too important to discard. Concepts once held true, foundations of beliefs taught to us by others' perceptions and perspectives, faults now. Naysayers would have us believe we are incapable. Evolution, rare and fleeting, holds in vessels designed to keep spilling out. I am not that any longer. We are not that any longer. Once rife with insecurities, two-dimensional tendencies and renderings, I don't need to be, for you to believe in me or remind me of the person you thought I once was. A small smile, a nod of understanding. I'll be on my way, climbing through multifaceted terrains into new universes and new experiences with the world at my feet and in my head. Thank you. This piece is called Taste. Taste is the memory of the body, an instant recognition of a long ago happening, experiences that shape perspective, heartstrings tugged by nostalgia, a scent, a flavor, a texture, swirling long forgotten things our bodies remember. They recognize seasons through tastes of food, connecting instantly awakening sensations, arroz con dulce, 
I don't know how to make it, but the moment that it touches my tongue, I remember the boxes of raisin, the sticks of canela, tall pots stirred and stirred and stirred. Bernil, marinated in oil, vinegar, garlic, and herbs. The palate never forgets. Texture of buttery goodness falling apart in my mouth. Coquito. Spiked with rum so that my sense of smell to this very day captures the memories of the bottles that line the counter. Liquid soldiers, reinforcements for long nights and laughter. Each season tastes different. Unique in muscle memory, triggering goosebumps, smiles, people. The anticipation of each is palpable. When the winds change, carrying the tail ends of now away, sweeping in the next inhaling of bodily sense. I can already taste spring. Thank you. This is uh, a tribute to Abuelita, my grandma, uh, and traditions that started young. Abuelita, thank you for rooting in me pan, sobao, mantequilla, y café con leche. Sitting on your lap at the age of five, I learned how those amazing flavors, textures, and scents created core memories. This was our time, rarely visited. At the long dining table next to a chinero, manteli plástico hugging the 12-seat oval. Dark wood of high-backed ornate cushioned chairs echoing the caramel hues of Bustelo y Lechipoti. Pan de manteca sitting on its white sleeve, bakery letters in red, plastic twist tie bag cast aside for later if any remains. Mantequilla, butter, half melted, half hard, holding onto the pockets of white baked goodness, crunchy shell leaving bread chips behind. In those moments, which can never be recreated, I learned to love butter and bread soaked in café con leche. Learn to savor the mush when dipped for too long. Speckles of butter bobbing around, dancing along the rim of the mug. Although the bakeries are no longer there and the bread doesn't taste the same, to this day I dunk el bollo de pan. If only once, saludos abuelita. Con mucho amor. Thank you. Thank you, Rescue. That was just beautiful. Um, our next reader is Rhonda Miller. I'm going to start with my poem, Hallowed Ground, which was for Cheyenne Bottoms, Kansas. Liz, I can't tell you how much all of us appreciate you and what you're doing for our country and just for land and the environment and everything. Thank you so much. Hallowed Ground, Cheyenne Bottoms, Kansas. Dark streams form trains. Blackbirds and starlings trail the horizon east to west. Susurration, murmuration, crescendo from the cattail jungle where nights were spent. They devour spilled crops at sunrise. The Cheyenne called it snow moon, hunger moon. Ride with a great blue heron under a full moon. Their clacking sound at twilight, the off season, a fierce fight of survival. Water takes refuge in sky, reflects vanquished barren ground. Hope drifts windward, flutters amid a thousand geese in winged flight, imprint black against each other, magnified by pools of water. I pause in reflection, a reminder of hallowed ground as seasons cycle round. The next poem is from my second book of poetry by the uh, same name entitled Moonstain. Barn doors pushed shut, an indication something worth investigating was within. It took all my strength to open, slide to close again. New birth in pungent urgency led me to the stillborn calf, quite warm. I nestled in the hay beside it, placed my arms around its neck. I knew what death was, had heard whispers of my mother's not long before and I could hear the mother cow's loud bawling from outside the back barn door. I felt the spirit of the calf lift, swirl around me, disappear. It grew cold. I felt damp fear. 
I sat in the collegianist stall until my sister came, took my hand, ran with me past my grandmother's blood moon lit garden of hollyhocks, iris, strawberries, rhubarb, past the spot where rattler soaked up water from a sprinkler one August day, past the rotted elm where winged fire ants swarmed in balls before they tumbled to the ground. We opened the rusted screen door, tiptoed to bed where I lay crying because it felt so wondrous, because it felt so good, until the moon stain no longer spread across the floor. This next one is also from uh, the book entitled Moonstain called What My Mother Didn't Teach Me, I Learned from the Prairie. My initial roots were shallow. They had no place to root or grow. I tried once, then again, praying it could be so. There was no bosom to rest my head, nor covers with which to make a bed. I was a seedling transplanted here, then there, feeling so alone. Then one evening, down by the rickery breaks, the prairie spoke to me, and this is what she said. The seed to life lives within you. The prairie wind has all you need of touch. Run with it, not against it. You don't have to be so tough. The wind will caress you, bring sensation to your life. The prairie offers grasses, berries, mammals, all you need to thrive. Prairie creeks run deep, bring crystal waters to refresh your soul. It is thirsty for so much. Notice the colors that surround you. They are a prairie rainbow show. The yarrow brings you gaiety, the thistle hardiness, native grasses spontaneity, feel the tickle in their touch. Find freedom in the tumbleweeds. They teach you how to roam. No constraints to bind you. The prairie soil is hairy loam. Mother Earth will hold you. She rocks you as we speak. Every step you take plants roots deep. You grow through memories, through all of those you love. Your words spread as seedlings, your tears like rain from above. I dusted off my blue jeans, but before climbing to my feet, I kissed the pra prairie soil beneath them. Lord, it smelled so sweet. I heard the metal lark trickling water in the creek. The wind soothed my fears. I believed what I'd been told. Then I heard this whisper. You've never been alone. The prairie is your home. 